Key point one, brain, more than just hardwired circuitry. This summary is meant to uphold the fact that the human brain is indeed capable of change. This fact is propelled by the testimonies of scientists, doctors, and patients. Patients with brain diseases previously considered incurable were healed by utilizing the knowledge of the brain's inherent ability to change. The common misconception of the human brain is that as we grow, it begins a slow and continuous decline. After childhood, if brain cells are lost due to injury or damage, they will not be replaced. The implication of this misconception is that people who suffered brain damage of any form in the past had to remain like that for life. However, this belief was backed up by three factors. The inability of patients suffering from brain damage to make a full recovery. The lack of information on the microscopic activities of the brain. And the belief that the brain is the ultimate machine and like machines, it can't grow or change. Dr. Norman Doidge experienced failures in his career, which were attributed to the fact that the brain was hardwired. Although this was accepted in the world of medicine, it still bothered the research psychiatrist and psychoanalyst that his patients did not progress as expected. As a result, when he came to the knowledge that there was hope, the brain might not have been as hardwired as everyone was led to the belief. He began investigating. He wanted to find proof for himself, and his studies led him to travel far and wide until he met a series of scientists. These scientists were at the forefront of all brain-related studies. Dr. Norman Doidge had the opportunity to converse with laureates who were focused on making the most of the newly discovered, ever-changing brain. This guide summarizes his encounters and lessons. Key point two, failures accompanying a defective vestibular apparatus. This section will discuss the experience of a brain-damaged patient, Cheryl Schlitz. She often imagines herself off-balance, and as a result, her body turns out off-balance. If she pictures herself falling, she falls. To classify her problem using technical terms, it can be said that Cheryl Schlitz's problem stems from her vestibular apparatus. It is the organ responsible for keeping the entire body balanced. This condition led to her losing her job and receiving a monthly disability payment of $1,000. She suffers from a rare type of anxiety that doctors and experts have not yet been able to properly label. Dr. Norman Doidge witnessed the work of great scientists in the case of Cheryl Schlitz. She was worked on by Paul Bakirita and his team. By all indications, the case of Cheryl Schlitz was helpless. By utilizing one of Bakirita's prototypes, Cheryl Schlitz has been trained to maintain balance despite her fatal condition. Although she can't function without the prototype, when the prototype is in operation, she is kept balanced. This gives her an entirely new look. All her woes disappear, and she experiences peace one more time. Despite the fact that this is only possible when she is using the machine, she still references this change as a miracle. The machine functions by taking data from her tongue straight to the part of the brain responsible for the balance. This means that rather than being fooled by her eyes and imagination, the tongue sends accurate signals which keeps this section of the brain satisfied. Based on the success of the machine, these scientists are currently seeking ways through which they can reduce the size of the machine. They want it to fit comfortably within the mouth of patients. If they are successful, patients will be able to lead normal lives without anyone knowing they have a brain injury. Machines have been created to correct the defective portion of the brain, vestibular apparatus, responsible for imbalances in the body. Key point three, a woman labeled retarded found how to heal herself. It is conventional that scientists with perfect brains work on patients with defective brains. However, Barbara arrowsmith Young is an exception to this rule. Barbara was an extremely gifted child, but her mind suffered from intellectual asymmetry. She was both smart and retarded. This effect was seen physically, even when she was a child. She had difficulty in pronunciation and lacked the ability of spatial reasoning. In addition, her kinesthetic perception was out of balance. And as a result, she could not tell how far out her arms and legs had moved away from her body. There are manifold defects of the brain, but there are some that make gifted beings out of their victims. To make matters worse, Barbara was born in a time when brain science was not common. Hence, she took it upon herself to provide solutions to her dilemma. She soon enrolled in graduate school, 
where her gifts outshined her disabilities. In time, a fellow student named Joshua Cohen persuaded her to study the books of Alexander Luria. She had to go over these books multiple times. Luria's goal was to go beyond the boundaries of the then-existing psychoanalytic technique. Reading Luria's writings made Barbara realize that she had a problem, and she began craving a solution. Eventually, a paper came to her desk. A scientist proved that activity could create changes in the structure of the brain. This sparked light for her case, and she began attempting to modify her brain with complex symbol identification exercise. She got her friend to design cards with clocks telling different times, and then write the correct time at the back of the card. She raced through these cards for days trying to identify the correct time. She had no idea if this strategy was going to work or not. We see with our brains, not with our eyes. Dr. Norman Doidge. In time, Barbara began succeeding. She could read clocks faster than normal people. This success led her to work on her other difficulties like logic and grammar. She succeeded in this endeavor as well. Eventually, she created exercises to cure all her damaged brain functions. She was able to build them all up to an average level. In 1980, she got married to a man named Joshua Cohen. Key point four. What neuroplasticity teaches us about sexual attraction and love? A was a fine young man who had just made it out of an abusive relationship and was seeking the help of Dr. Norman Dewage. He loved the wrong type of women. They always treated him roughly. This could be attributed to his relationship with his mother, who was a needy and seductive alcoholic. She was off the rails throughout his childhood, and his job was to keep her sane. The relationship he shared with his parents is the exact type of relationship he desired from his women. He only had a taste for women who were violent towards him. Humans vary in their preferences. We all want different partners and have varying sexual desires. A case of a homosexual man whose desires changed based on what was trending. This proves that the human libido is not fixed, but fickle and capable of change. There have been mentions of individuals who change partly experience heterosexual and homosexual urges for part of their lives. The question is, does a relationship exist between sexual plasticity and neuroplasticity? The answer is yes. They are both subject to change. What rules guide sexual plasticity and neuroplasticity? Studies have revealed that the complex maps are similar to simpler maps as they are governed by the same principles. A. E. Gullies notes that sexual instincts stand out due to their adaptability and ability to change their objectives. The concept of sexual plasticity isn't a recent one. Plato, in his discussions about love, suggested that human eros has various manifestations. However, it was Sigmund Freud who established the groundwork for a neuroscientific interpretation of sexual and romantic adaptability. Ironically, some of our most stubborn habits and disorders are products of our plasticity. Dr. Norman Dewage. Our sexual instincts are flexible. There have been previous arguments in favor of the plasticity of our sexuality. Freud argued that sexual ability developed in stages. This is evidenced by the experience of A. The first stage of sexual development occurs when a child is with his parents. If the parents are loving and sweet, the child will seek loving relationships in life. However, if the parents are cold and distant, the child will seek similar relationships. Although there are exceptions, scientists have confirmed Freud's hypothesis. Key point five. Stroke victim learns to move and speak again. Michael Bernstein was an accomplished surgeon and tennis buff. At the age of 54, he had an incapacitating stroke, which he got out of using neuroplastic therapy. Before the stroke, he had just completed an operation on eight patients. Thereafter, he went for a game, and his partner observed that he was balanced. His workers and family also noticed the change in his appearance, and his doctor offered him medication to prevent his blood from clotting. A stroke can significantly degrade the body, leading to coordination loss, but there's usually hope for recovery. After Bernstein's treatment, he was still unable to perform normal body functions. This problem led him to visit Taub Therapy Clinic. He described the experience as challenging. The specialists were truly dedicated. They worked all through the time they were at work. They moved cans, washed tablespoons, and practiced circular movement. The treatment was very effective. 
Within two weeks, he was able to write using his left hand again. When the treatment session ended, Bernstein improved greatly. He then got electrical stimulation for his arm. Today, he runs his business and plays tennis three times weekly. The growth and speed of his recovery were overwhelming. He still has some residual problems with his body movement, but these problems are only apparent to him. To the rest of the world, Bernstein does not seem like someone who had once been completely paralyzed. When Dr. Norman Deutsch visited him, he wrote down his ABCs, and they were well-shaped. The author found it difficult to believe that he suffered from a stroke. Despite his recovery, he did not return to performing surgery for fear of being sued. There is no jury that will believe that he completely recovered from total paralysis and was fit to perform surgery. Key point six, brain plasticity. Key to overcoming worries and compulsions. Worrying is one of the many defects that come with being an intelligent being. It is a part of the package whether we like it or not. However, worry is in levels. There are people whose level of worry pushes them to commit suicide. Of all the kinds of worrying in existence, the most destructive form of worry is referred to as obsessive-compulsive disorder. People with this form of disorder believe that they or the people they love will soon be harmed. This form of worry is known to alter the brain. Patients with obsessive-compulsive disorder, OCD, are known to focus completely on their problems. They begin taking action in order to prevent their fears from coming to the past. You will observe that people with OCD often impose correction on themselves and others in order to prevent their fears from taking place. Dr. Norman Deutsch made mention of a woman who spent hundreds of hours rewriting her PhD dissertation with brief letters. She did this for fear of using the wrong words or sentences. People have to understand that people like this are not perfectionists. They are simply suffering from OCD. The bad news is that OCD treatment is difficult. The available medication and therapy only help a handful of people. But plasticity-based treatments will provide fitting solutions to the disorder. This was accomplished by Jeffrey M. Schwartz, who designed a treatment for people with OCD and those with general worries. His treatment also covers treatment abuse, obsessive jealousy, excessive concern for the well-being of others, and unusual sexual behavior. By using brain scans from people with and without OCD, Schwartz was able to design a therapy for people with OCD. He tested his therapy using scans as well. The success of his method proved that the brain could be altered through talking therapy. Did you know? According to a research conducted at Harvard University, it was found that more than one million new neural connections form every second in the first few years of human life. Key point seven, the dark side of plasticity. Neuroplasticity is both a blessing and a curse. It favors the perfection of our senses, but subjects us to high levels of pain. V. Lanner Subramanian Ramachandran is a neurologist who uses 19th century science to solve 21st century problems. Ramachandran is the head of the Center for Brain and Cognition at the University of California. He uses a different approach to neuroplasticity. He believes that brain functions can be altered by imagination and perception. The worst pain humans suffer is referred to as phantom pain. Phantom pain is experienced by amputees. Dr. Norman Deutsch made mention of a British admiral who lost his arm in war, but still felt as though the arm was present. This is an example of phantom pain. Doctors are then tasked to heal pains on limbs that are non-existent. These pains are known to last a lifetime. This occurs when the pain of an injury damages the nerves in our pain systems causing neuropathic pain. As a result, individuals still feel the same level of pain years after the accident or injury. A 17-year-old boy named Tom Sorensen was involved in a brutal accident. He soon discovered the phantom effect and began searching for solutions. V. Lanner Subramanian Ramachandran heard of him from his colleagues and decided to work with him. While working with him, he confirmed that a link does exist between his face and his phantom arm. After some trial and error, Tom found that he could alleviate his persistent itch, which had bothered him for ages, by scratching his cheek. His initial success with a Q-tip led to more advanced methods, including a brain scan known as magnetoencephalography, MEG. This scan, when applied to Tom's hand and arm, 
revealed that the area of his brain responsible for hand sensations was now processing feelings from his face. Essentially, his brain's hand and face regions had merged. Ramachandran's discovery in the case of Tom Sorensen initially met with skepticism from clinical neurologists who doubted the malleability of brain maps. However, this idea is now broadly accepted. Further brain scan studies by a German research team have also confirmed a direct relationship between the level of neuroplasticity and the severity of phantom pain experienced by individuals. Conclusion As we get older and our neuroplasticity diminishes, adapting to the world becomes increasingly challenging, even with the desire to change. We naturally enjoy familiar stimuli, gravitate towards people who share our views, and studies indicate that we often disregard, forget, or try to discredit information that challenges our established beliefs or worldview. This is because processing thoughts and perceptions in new ways can be very unsettling and demanding. The insights from neuroplasticity and the plastic paradox highlight that our neural adaptability plays a role in both the restrictive and expansive aspects of human behavior. Indeed, the evolution of Western political thought is largely influenced by differing perspectives on human adaptability throughout history and among various thinkers. Nonetheless, a thorough examination of neuroplasticity today reveals its nuanced nature. It's too intricate to be used to definitively support either a more limited or expansive view of human nature, as it contributes to both our adaptability and inflexibility, depending on its development. In clinical discussions about brain plasticity, it's important to avoid assigning blame to those who may not benefit from this new science or cannot change. While neuroplasticity confirms the brain's capacity for change, equating this changeability with perfection sets unrealistically high expectations. In this era where brain plasticity garners significant interest, it's crucial to acknowledge that it can lead to both positive and negative outcomes, such as rigidity and vulnerability, as well as adaptability and surprising resourcefulness. Try this. To help individuals who are recovering from a brain injury that has potential of recovery, the following steps may prove helpful. Increase your thought through sharpening perception and memory. Resurrect the mind by trying to move and speak. This helps recovery in stroke patients. Build your imagination by deliberate thinking. 